All right, hello and welcome to the second half of the course. Congratulations on making it to the midpoint. Uh, everybody's midterms are graded. Uh, most of you did well, so I'm glad to see that. Um, today we're going to talk about the Roman Republic, and today's Roman Republic and Wednesday will be Roman Empire. This entire week is Rome. All right, so geography of Italy. I know this map is not from Roman times, but it'll be good enough for what we need. Uh, you can see that the Alps are kind of like the hat on top of the Italian peninsula. That's important because it kept out outside invaders. In fact, the only place you can really get into Rome or Italy easily is from the east. More importantly are the Apennines or Apennines that go down the middle of the, the peninsula. They're usually, they average 30 to 60 miles wide. Sometimes there's little foothills. The peaks can be as high as 9,000 feet. Think of it kind of like the Appalachians. There are a lot of lakes and streams. There are a lot of valleys. And there were a lot of little uh, settlements that were in there. And these settlements are gonna become little, uh, little cultures. It's also surrounded by water. Um, you've got the Adriatic Sea. You've got the Ionian Sea the Tyrrhenian Sea and the Mediterranean Sea. All right, three groups you need to know for the early inhabitants. There's one group called the Etruscans. Uh, they're from a place called Etruria, today known as Tuscany. That's where the word Tuscany comes from, is Etruscan. Uh, they were fairly advanced for their time period. Um, there were only two classes of people. There is the aristocracy and then there was the commoner. They did a lot of commerce. They traded with their neighbors a lot. And they borrowed a lot of things from the Greeks. Like they borrowed their arts, their government, their religion, all from the Greeks. They borrowed the idea of the city-state or the polis. Um, they changed the name. So instead of Zeus, you have Jupiter. And instead of Hera, you have Juno. Instead of Ares, you've got Mars. So they kept the same gods, they just kind of rechanged the names. They also conquered some of their neighbors. One of the groups of people they conquered were called the Latins. And the Latins, I'll talk about in just a moment. Um, eventually the Etruscans, they, they kind of disappear. They, they have this downfall. It's because their system is so rigid, it can't adopt or change to, uh, to different scenarios. All right, second are the Greeks. All those Greeks I talked about that were moving and colonizing other places, a lot of them went to Southern Italy. And there are so many Greeks in Southern Italy, they call it Greater Greece or Magna Graecia. They keep the Greek culture, city-states, it's not unified. Uh, they bring their religion, their architecture, their writing, their, their culture, everything. They do a lot of trading with the Etruscans, they do a lot of trading with the Latins, they do a lot of trading with people around them. Now the Latins, we know them better as the Romans. Now Latins and Romans are the same thing, but they're not. Romans were Latin people who lived in the city of Rome. And eventually the Rome becomes <clears throat> the dominant city, and so the Latins become known as the Romans. Now they settled along a river called the Tiber, uh, the site that we know of is Rome. It had people there as early as 1400 BC, but the founding date of Rome is given as 753 BC, and that's because that's the first time that people stayed there permanently. Now, the Latins, they're conquered by the Etruscans. The Latins learn everything they can from the Etruscans, and then about 150 years later or so, they overthrow the Etruscans and flip the table on them, so to speak. Now, after the Romans are going to overthrow the Etruscans, they decide to start taking over people around them. The Romans, they show this great military skill, this great diplomatic skill. They make friends when they can. They convince people to join their side when they can. And then they fight when they have to. Now, there's a guy named Cincinnatus who becomes like the symbol of Rome. Uh, long story short, Cincinnatus is a former leader. He retires to a flower 
garden or a farm of flowers, if you will. Uh, the Romans get into a war with some people called the Samnites. The war's not going well, and so the government of Rome freaks out, comes to Cincinnati, and says, lead our armies to victory. Cincinnati says, okay. Goes away with the army. He's gone for, I think it's 14 days. He comes back. He says, okay, the war's over, and I'm going back to my flowers. He was offered the powers of a dictator. He was offered to become leader for life, and he says, no, I don't need to do that. I was just being a good citizen. So that's what a good Roman citizen is supposed to do. And Rome tries to do that for a while. When they conquest people, when they take over people, they give citizenship to the people they conquer. They try and invite people in, but it only goes so far. In the year 390 BC, the Gauls, who were from southern France, they're going to conquer Rome. They're going to take over Rome and over a thousand pounds of gold is taken out of the city. Afterwards, the Romans realize, you know what, we have to change something. They redo their military. They form these things called legions, and each legion had 5,000 people, and they just, they're not defeated again for years. Now, anybody they conquered, they get citizenship, but in return, they have to pay taxes and they have to serve in the military. All right, there are two classes in Rome. There's the plebeians, there's the patricians. Plebeians are lower class, patricians are upper class. Plebeians have a little power, patricians have most of the power. There are some plebeians who have wealth equal to patricians, but it's about what family you're born into more than how much money you have as an individual. So patricians form clans. These clans are gonna dominate society, dominate politics, dominate everything. Plebeians are just going to try to get by as much as they can. Now, the Roman government is set up so that there are two groups. There's the magistrates, who all serve one year term. You've got consuls, who are the, the chief officials. They're the ones in charge of running day-to-day -day operations. You've got case stores, who are in charge of the money, and they're the ones who serve as prosecutors in courts. Uh, praetors, they're kind of like vice consuls. Whenever the consul has to go away for business, the praetor steps in. Uh, they are also the ones in charge of the courts and in charge of the justice system. And then last but not least, you have censors. Censors, they censor things. They determine who can serve in office. They determine who can vote. And they do a census. That's why they're called censors. Uh, there's another half to the Roman government called the Senate, the Senatus Populus K. Romanus, the Senate and people of Rome. Senators serve for life. They cannot make law, but because of the prestige that goes around them, because they're seen as the keepers of wisdom, whatever the Senate says is going to have the force of law. The consul's not going to go against the Senate. So if the Senate says, do X, Y, Z, the consul is going to make X, Y, Z the rule of law. Now, it doesn't work for everybody. Eventually, we're going to get something called the struggle of the orders. The plebeians, the lower class people, are going to want more say and more participation in government. So, in 494 BC, the plebeians, they're going to go on strike. They're going to refuse to serve in the military, and it's going to scare the pants off the patricians. It's going to scare the patricians so much that for the next 200 years, the plebeians get pretty much anything they demand. One of the first things that the plebeians demand is the right to have their own assembly. It's called the Concilium Plebis, or the Council of the People, or the Council of the Plebes. They're allowed to pass laws that affect the lower class and the lower class only. After that, the plebeians are given tribunes, their own set of magistrates. A tribune is basically a consul for the lower class, but with one really, really powerful uh, duty. The tribune can overrule or veto anything that the magistrates say. 
Now you might have the question, well, why didn't the people just kill the tribunes? It's because there were people who were sworn to protect the tribunes, and if somebody killed the tribune, then those people would go and hunt the killer. So we've got the right to assemble. We've got our own legislatures. Now we have to go to law. Originally, laws in Rome weren't written down. Only the patricians knew how the laws worked. Only the patricians knew what the law said. Well, the plebeians demand it all be written down, and you get the law of the Twelve Tablets. All of the laws were written down and made public on these 12 bronze tablets that were displayed in the city of Rome. Not only that, but they put down all the legal proceedings so that everybody can read how court works, how the laws are applied, etc., etc. About 50 years after that, the plebeians are given the, a law code called the Lex Hortensia, and the Lex Hortensia makes it so that the council of the plebes, any laws they make apply to both social classes. So it looks like we've gotten really quality here. The plebeians went from nothing to having their own assembly, their own leaders, equal protection under the law, and laws that apply to everybody, but not so much. There's this thing called patronage, and patronage was the key to the Roman political system, and it kept patri the patricians in charge because they're the ones who could afford special duties or special favors. Basically what happens is a patron would go to somebody in need and say, hey, I'll pay off your car if you give me your vote. Or I'll represent you in court, just vote for me. And before you know it, those patricians are the ones in charge again because they're helping everybody out. They're, they're helping those in need in exchange for political votes. Now, what would happen if one of these patrons didn't keep their word? Well, they'd more often than not be killed. So, it's a little bit of a give and take here. Now, once that's all done, you start to get these overseas conquests. And it was thought that conquest was the only way that Rome could grow. Conquest was the only way that the plebeians could gain land. And this Roman imperialism, it's present in two different forms. You have Roman imperialism to the west, meaning Western Europe. People like the Gauls, who today are known as the French, uh, Germanic people, Spanish people, who then were known by uh, a different name, uh, Iberians. They were treated like barbarians. It was hack and slash, see how many people you could kill. In the east, though, meaning Greece, it was civilized. It was wealthy. And the people there were treated like equals. So Rome's expansion took two very, very, very different looks. Now the, the big point of Roman expansion comes with the Punic Wars. And that's going to be Rome versus the city of Carthage. You can see that the empire of the Carthaginians is in purple. The Roman Republic is in red. And really the big thing that they're going to fight over is the island of Sicily. That's the football that Italy is, cook is kicking. Now in 275 BC, the Romans defeat this Greek king named Pyrrhus. They take over parts of Greece. Uh, Carthage and King Pyrrhus were allies. And after King Pyrrhus is defeated, Rome is going to turn around, attack Sicily, and start a war with Carthage. Now, the First Punic War is going to last for almost 25 years. It's a Roman victory. And one really interesting thing that happens is when this war starts, Rome had no navy whatsoever. The navy of Carthage was great. The navy of Rome didn't really exist. Well, three ships that belonged to Carthage wash up on the Roman sea, um, seashore the Romans reverse engineer the ship, build copies that are better than the ships that Carthage had, and that's why they win the war. Now afterwards, there's this peace that exists, and in 221 BC, a man named Hannibal 
decides to declare war on Italy again. Hannibal's actually avenging his father. His father's name was Hamilcar, H-A-M-I-L-C-A-R. And Hamilcar, his deathbed confession, he basically says, avenge me, my son. And Hannibal says, okay. Now Hannibal somehow loads elephants onto boats, sails across the Mediterranean Sea into Spain, and then marches these elephants all the way across the Alps and into Roman territory. So you have attack elephants attacking the Roman Republic. I don't understand it, but it happened. Now, Hannibal is going to win the Battle of Cannae, which is one of the most famous battles of all time. If you ever go into the military, you're probably going to study it today. Uh, long story short there, Hannibal's army is able to surround the army of Rome and defeats 80,000 warriors. It looks like Hannibal is going to win the Second Punic War. But secretly, a Roman army is going to sneak out of the city. It's led by a guy named Scipio Africanus. It's going to sail across the Mediterranean Sea, and it's going to attack Carthage in the year 202. Hannibal, not expecting this, has to rush back home, try to defend his city, and in the end, he loses. Now, there is a third Punic War. It begins around 150 BC. It's not very big. It's not very long. The end story is Carthage is completely destroyed by Rome. Now real quick, a little bit about the life in the Roman Republic. Um, the rural life, we have diaries of a guy named Marcus Cato who tells us about his family. Uh, he's pretty common and typical of a rural family. He was what, what's called a pater familias. He had complete control of his house. He was the head of household. He could order his kids killed if he wanted to. That's how much power he had. Um, but he said to be a fairly reasonable guy, and he would—he didn't kill anybody. He would actually ask his family for input and insight. Now, in a rural life, um, the day would start very early in the morning, they wanted to avoid the heat, they'd eat a light breakfast, and then they would go out and work. Cato had two jobs, he was a farmer and a lawyer. Now, most of the farming was gonna be done by hired help or servants, so in reality, he would walk around town and find people he could represent. And Cato actually got very, very powerful by doing this because he became a patron. Uh, Cato's wife, we unfortunately don't know her name, as far as I know, her name's never mentioned in the diaries, but we do know that she ran the household, she made the clothes, she supervised the, the family slaves, and she raised the kids. Uh, the kids, they were raised together until the age of seven, but at the age of seven, boys start training to be warriors and politicians, and girls start training to be homemakers. Uh, we also know the children had pets. They loved to play games with dice, and uh, Marcus Cato wrote about the dog the family had too. Their biggest meal of the day was lunch. Um, you can see there what they would have. Afterwards, there would be a nap. But if you're a slave or a hired laborer, no nap for you. And yes, slavery was common. Um, there were lots of slaves usually made up of prisoners of war. Rome had a lot of war, so it wasn't hard to get prisoners. In fact, there was actually a problem with Romans letting so many slaves free that they had to put limits on how many slaves per year could be free. There were some rebellions. Uh, Spartacus, if you've heard of him, he was the most famous to rebel. It took almost a year. Uh, actually, it took over a year to put his rebellion down. And then for religion, uh, they had the Greek gods who were repackaged as Roman gods. So, you have Jupiter, Juno, you would have uh, Mars, Aphrodite, etc., etc. Venus, not Aphrodite, etc., etc. Urban life is a little different. Uh, Scipio Amelanus, that's the son of Scipio Africanus, uh, he's going to live a life of luxury in the city of Rome. And he's a great example of what happens when you're wealthy. Uh, Greek culture was preferred by people living in the cities. Uh, people like 
like Emilanus are taught to read and write Latin and Greek. They're taught Roman training. They're taught Greek philosophy. Uh, Greek art is copied. Greek art is studied. And then you have this Roman bathhouse. Now, it's not just a bunch of people sitting in a bathtub. Think of a Roman bathhouse more like a uh, country club. So you would have saunas, you would have um, eateries, you would have whatever their equivalent to golf was. Uh, that's more what a Roman bathhouse was. Uh, so you would rub elbows with important people and that's where the real business would be done in Rome. Uh, in the city, the evening meal, dinner, supper, whatever you want to call it, it was the most important meal of the day. Uh, you would have these large gatherings to show off your wealth. People would eat peacock and ostrich and all this fancy stuff. And you would basically try to outdo your neighbors. The more fancy your food is, the fancier the family, the more wealthy you look. Now, all good things come to an end, and the Republic really starts to decline around 150 BC. Uh, the cost of the Punic Wars is going to create a financial catastrophe. On top of that, by 150 BC, the Constitution, it's not working anymore because the government was meant for a small city-state, not a large empire. So they have to come up with this form of administration, governors are appointed, other officials are appointed, tax officials have to be hired, taxes have to be collected, the army has to get bigger, there's lots of corruption, it's not very good. Plus, on top of that, almost all of the land is owned by wealthy families. These wealthy families would buy or take land. Sometimes when Roman soldiers were out doing their duty, they would come back and they'd find that their land has been claimed by one of these wealthy patricians and there's nothing they can do about it. On top of that, there's huge unemployment because there, there are so many slaves that it's cheaper to buy a slave than it is to hire somebody to do your work. Now there are three people, uh, there's, they're known as the tyrants. There's Tiberius Gracchus. Uh, he is elected tribune in 133. He looks around and sees the trouble with society. He says, you know what, let's take public land, let's give it to the soldiers, and let's give the soldiers something for their trouble. Well, when that law is passed, he's murdered by a mob, and the mob was led by the chief priest or the high priest of Rome. A couple years later, his brother, Gaius Gracchus, is going to be elected tribune, and he's going to pick up where his brother left off. He's going to pass laws that give the, the poor food. He's going to pass laws that give the poor grain. He's going to try and help the landless. Uh, he says, why don't we take all the people without jobs and send them to form colonies. We'll spread our culture. We'll get money back from them. Well, for his, his service, he got murdered by a mob of senators. Then finally, a third person, you got Gaius Marius. He was a commoner who was elected tribune in 119 BC, and then he eventually gets elected consul in 107 BC. Uh, he's going to change the army. He's going to let people who do not have property serve, which was a big change. And he's going to promise soldiers land for their, for their service. And the Roman Senate's going to turn against him, and a civil war is going to start. Well, Gaius Marius, his army was loyal to him personally, not Rome. So his army follows him after the Roman Senate declares war. Now last but not least, Julius Caesar. And before I do Julius Caesar, here is your secret word. Sorry for the noise in the background. My two-year-old toddler has entered the room. And the secret word is in honor of him. For the past two weeks, I have been held captive by a TV show called Bubble Guppies. And today's secret word, because of that, is going to be the word bubble, B-U-B-B-L-E. If you've never seen the bubble guppies, uh, it gets old really quick. But anyways, moving on from the secret word, which is bubble, B-U-B-B-L-E, Julius Caesar. Julius Caesar was a Roman hero. He was a great general. He defeated France. He, de he defeated Spain. And after the Civil War between... 
Sulla and Gaius Marius and, and the Senate, he's been in power along with a guy named Crassus and a guy named Pompey. Now, side note, Crassus and Pompey, they were the two generals who ended the revolt of Spartacus. When it comes to 50 BC, he's going to march on Rome. He's going to cross the Rubicon, and he is going to seize power, and then he's going to try and give it back to the people of Rome, because Crassus and Pompey and Sulla, they had been ruling for the Senate, not for the people. He's going to extend full Roman citizenship to the people living in Italy. He's going to set up colonies. Over 80,000 unemployed Romans are going to be sent throughout Europe. And he sleeps with Cleopatra, we can't forget that, and gains control of her kingdom. Well, unfortunately for Julius Caesar, he's going to be murdered by senators in 44 BC. Um, you may have heard of the famous Shakespeare play, or maybe the words, A2 Brute, and you Brutus. And he's said to have been mar murdered on March 17th, no, I'm sorry, March 15th, 44 BC. Well, in the end, his adopted son, Octavian, and his two top generals, Mark Antony and Lepidus, are going to hunt down the killers of Caesar. All right, next video for next week, it's going, or for Wednesday, not next week, but Wednesday. It'll be the Roman Empire, and then I'll talk a little bit about the research paper. But until Wednesday, that's all I have for you. Uh, 26 minutes is plenty of your time, so we'll see you later. Bye-bye.